Now the three martini lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And a welcome everyone to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America, reminding you that you have exactly two weeks to pre-order your copy of The Weed Agency by Jim Garrity. The book is coming out in exactly two weeks from now. Get it while you can. And we'll be talking about that, of course, much more as we get closer to uh, publication date. Uh, we've got good, bad, and crazy martinis for you as usual. We start with the good, and Jim, it's hard to find a lot of good news in terms of the VA scandal right now, particularly these secret lists and the double sets of books at an ever-growing number of medical institutions and specifically VA institutions around the country. But on his special commentary on Special Report last night, Britt Hume of the Fox News Channel went a step further saying, look, even when the VA is working normally, quote-unquote, it's still a mess for one very simple reason. The fact is that long waits for care are common to government-run, taxpayer-funded health systems. Think of all the complaints you've read about long waits for care in the socialized medical systems in Britain and Canada. They are what happens when the government owns and operates the hospitals, pays the doctors and nurses, and finances it all out of a central budget. And then he went on to say it's not only the case when they provide every step along the way, but even when they just pay the bills, as such as liberals want to do with single payers. So if it's Medicare... That's a debacle, certainly financially, among other reasons. And Medicaid, of course, they're paying all the bills. Yet, most of the time, folks have a very hard time seeing a doctor because doctors want nothing to do with Medicaid. So good point by Hume here, uh, Jim, not just that there's rampant corruption in this story, but even when this thing works the way it was designed, it's still a mess. Yeah, this is a, a thoroughly depressing scandal on many different levels, starting with the first one. You talk to most veterans, some of them say that once they get care from the VA, they're pretty happy with them. They, they like their doctors. It's not a matter of the doctors within the VA system being bad. What it usually is, is a matter of just getting to the doctor and the issues of the paperwork and you know the various delays and things like that. You may recall that uh, we had a, a really kind of appalling conditions over at Walter Reed, and this was a fairly sizable scandal during the later years of the Bush administration. But by golly, you know, people who give up years of their life and, and risk life and limb for to preserve their country, by golly, deserve the very best care we can give them. I think most people is a broad bipartisan consensus that we owe them that. So everybody thinks we should do this. And yet through the mechanisms of government bureaucracy, a uh, topic which I've grown very familiar with, it just doesn't work the right way. The problem with socialized medicine, as we're seeing here with this VA scandal, is that your entire life is at the mercy of unmedi- un- unmotivated bureaucrats. Uh, and that's what we, we see here, which is that you know, if, if it's your care, if it's the care of someone you care about, they jump right on that really quickly. If it's you no, know, just somebody else and you've got to process that claim and you've got to review the documents and all that stuff, that it seems to go on forever. My colleague, Jonah Goldberg, has a really good post in the corner today who just kind of points out that, look, there's a, you know, everybody believes we should care for, for uh, veterans. This is no, there's no anti-veterans care constituency. And you can point to a really j- large increase, the amount of money going to the VA in the last couple of years. So it's not a matter of a lack of funding. So what is it? Well, it may just be inherent to the way the bureaucracy works. You know, you got bloat, you got incompetence, you got... Uh, inevitable delays and all that stuff. And now with this most, you know, most recent scandal, it's not just the you know, unforgivable delays in, in care, which has caused several veterans to lose their lives, up to 40 in one office, as we, uh, as we understand. It's the mendacity that, that they knew they had a major problem. Instead of addressing it, saying, look, we don't have enough doctors. Or, or we're not able to process the backlog of, of claims fast enough. They cooked the books. They had double sets of books, and they had secret lists. We're like, well, this person's been waiting a really long time, but we're not going to put that in that. Now, according to the Washington Times, the Bush administration, on the way out the door, warned the Obama administration that we have doubts about the data we're getting from our various uh, regional centers and offices. So we don't think they're being honest with this. Finally, the last layer, one that's probably probably just the most glaring, and I've written a bit about on Campaign Spot, is the how much Obama has won made elaborate promises about how much he was going to improve veterans' care, and then back on the campaign trail in 2012, boasted how much he had improved veterans' care. Now we see that's simply not the case at all. Spectacularly, appallingly, uh, wait times are still higher. It still is taking forever. And it just, they're, they're really, it's, it's all kind of been smoke and mirrors, this perception of improvement under Shinseki. And it's kind of, you know, if we talk to any veteran, and they basically be able to point out, actually, no, there, there really was quite a bit of a, the delays didn't get any shorter. The backlog is getting longer. Uh, disability claims are now being processed nine months. 
So basically, you can give birth in the amount of time it takes them to process your disability claim. Absolutely unforgivable. Longer ba backlogs of 125 days for initial benefits. Just, just unforgivable from top to bottom. Now, what Bert Hume points out, I think very accurately, is that, look, if the government cannot do a, you know, is it doing a terrible job of managing care for veterans, how will it do for everybody in America? And I think it's a very powerful argument against Obamacare, and you may see it spreading to this in the near future. I do think that front for now, front and center, for those of us on the right, and really for everybody in America, it ought to be, what the hell happened here at the VA? Whose fault is it? Whose responsibility is it? Who's, how, who's going to be held accountable? And how do we fix it? Uh, and then furthermore, we can say, okay, this is one more reason we can't have Obamacare, because you're just expanding this failed system to cover every single person in America. That's the good martini. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Hume did a good job of uh, articulating uh, the problem with the VA and, and why it's uh, systemic in, in a government-run healthcare system. All right, on to uh, the bad martini now. And, Jim, we hear these warnings, well, every few months. And it turns out that more people now believe that Iran may be just a few months away from deployable nuclear weapons. Uh, this from the Jerusalem Post. Head of political military affairs at the Defense Ministry, Amos Gilad, warns of storm clouds on the horizon and says Israel has not been able to stop the buildup of Hezbollah's rocket arsenal. He says Iran can break out nuclear weapons very quickly and Israel must maintain operational readiness for any threat that may arise. He says he believes that President Obama does not want an Iran with nuclear weapons. But he says they are still very, very close to getting it. He says, essentially, Iran's strategy is based on the twin goals of getting rid of choking international sanctions, check, and keeping the option of breaking out to nuclear weapons within a few months, he said. So, Jim, they're definitely working on the sanctions part. And uh, if this timetable is to be believed, uh, we've got a showdown coming before too long. Yeah, and I know it feels like we've seen these kinds of warnings from various Middle East experts for you know going back probably a decade or so. Look, this is a secret program, so it's hard to know precisely what level they're at. Uh, you know, Israel obviously knowing that they are in the crosshairs um, of, of a, you know, Iranian nuclear program are obviously going to be, you know, most focused on this. And, and I like kind of the metaphor. Ir Obama says we won't tolerate Iran with nuclear weapons. Iran says, OK, we'll build the infrastructure to get to nuclear weapons, including missile capabilities, scientists, etc. It's like a runner who can't jump two meters, so he builds a 1.95 meter ramp. So later he can jump from it and get to two meters. This is the greatest danger. It's the possibility Iran will achieve this. It's a potential existential threat, Gilad said. At what point does the distinguishing thing between being having nuclear weapons and being on the verge of nuclear weapons, how much does that difference matter to us? And there's kind of an indication that maybe we, our threshold should not be we will not tolerate Iran with nuclear weapons. Maybe we've got to move that line a little bit and say we cannot tolerate Iran being close to nuclear weapons. Then everybody gets the question of, all right, well, how close is too close uh, and all that stuff. Considering how badly Obama has managed to you know, handle, say, Ukraine, say, Syria, say, the VA, say, the healthcare website, how confident can we be that he and his team are really on top of the progress of the Iranian nuclear program? All right, on to the crazy well, martini. That's why that's the bad martini, and the VA <laughs> scandal, at least Yub's comment, is the good martini. <laughs> All right, on to the crazy martini now. And the president was at a fundraiser at a private home in Potomac, Maryland. That's a ritzy suburb of D.C. Uh, last night. Caused a small traffic jam on his way there. A little bit of difficulty with math. He told the audience there that he's at the tail end of his fifth year in office. But here's the quote that we want to get to. He says, I hate to be blunt about it, but that's the play, talking about by the Republicans. Their strategy is to make people more sufficiently cynical, sufficiently angry, sufficiently suspicious that they can win the next election. And he says, and by the way, when I say a party has been captured, it's because I actually want an effective, serious, patriotic, capable, sober-minded Republican Party. And we've had that in the past. I come from the land of Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln thought infrastructure was a pretty good idea. That's part of why we got an intercontinental railroad system. The debate we're having right now is about what? Benghazi? Obamacare? And it's become this endless loop. It's not serious. It's not speaking to the real concerns that people have. And, Jim, I guess uh, the people don't realize that because in public opinion surveys, both Benghazi, people want a lot more answers on that, and they still don't like Obamacare. You know, this this little transcript offered of, of what Obama says at a Democratic Party fundraiser's it's possible he's just offering red meat to a deep blue crowd um, and that he's kind of exaggerating for effect and things like that. Or this may be what he really thinks. And I think there's a lot of reason for us to believe this is what he really thinks, because according to the public statements, he's, you know, 
unbelievably furious about the VA thing, but he hasn't, you know, addressed it in extended comments. He made one brief comment during a Q&A overseas. Th these, these comments really kind of indicate that Obama is, uh, his mentality is every bit as bad as we think it is, walking around with this enormous sense of um, he's the only adult in the room, and if only people would listen to him, everything would be fine, and everybody who disagrees with him is crazy. And, and you know, like, there's always a presidential bubble, but he is deep within the bubble, and his may be hermetically sealed. <laughs> Well, the good news is if you're frustrated with all the bureaucracy we talked about in the good martini and the uh, relentless cynical politics in the uh, third martini, you can get a great break from that by picking up the weed agency. <laughs> yes, yes. There's no cynicism in that one at all. No, uh, yeah, no, I try, at least I try to be funny. Actually, let me just, you know, like, so this is the whiny author section, bonus section of the three martini lunch. So. When there's something like the GSA scandal, where you know government bureaucrats go to Las Vegas and stay in luxury hotels for conferences in which they do team building exercise, and the whole thing looks like a giant boondoggle and waste of money, that's a, a scandal you can make fun of and laugh at or something like that. In, in a ludicrous amount of self-pity that everyone will justifiably criticize, Greg, it's just my luck that a giant government bureaucratic scandal breaks right before the book comes out. <laughs> And it's this unbelievably awful, morbid, heartbreaking scandal. You can't make fun of it. Like you, you, this is not something you laugh about um, or chuckle about. This is a, you know, your blood is boiling. This is an outrage type scandal. And thus, I can't tie it in to promote the book. This is not to say uh, by any stretch of the imagination, I'm the real victim here. But I'm going to observe that like government incompetence that I do a lot of uh, mocking of in the book, uh, using real life examples and then some fictional examples that sound eerily plausible. Websites not working the way they're supposed to and things like that. That, that sometimes this has really awful real life deadly consequences. Jake Harney, you know, kept citing the um, American Legion as if they had praised the move when in fact they'd said this was business as usual. They are a, a you know, the cynicism I have in, in covering the government is nothing compared to the cynicism they have in actually governing us. And that's my cheery thought to conclude the day, Greg. Hope you're doing well. Wow. Folks, if you didn't already have a drink with us on this one, you're going to need one by the time you're done with this. Be be driving you to three martinis lunch. <laughs> Talk to you tomorrow, Jim. Have a good day. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And be sure to join us on Wednesday for the next edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Have a great day, everyone. Don't forget to order the Weed Agency.